I'm traveling back in time to when cowboys ruled the prairie. Yeehaw! When buffaloes roamed the plains. And when steam trains ran America. Whoa! This is the hardest working steam locomotive in the USA. They don't make them like this anymore, baby. This is living, breathing history right here today. My name is Matt Baum. Ever since I was a kid, I've been obsessed with trains. My day job, I work on a railroad in Maine. But this is my dream. To ride the biggest, fastest, most awesome trains in history. is the Union Pacific 844, the finest steam locomotive ever built. It's been pulling passengers and freight across the country since 1944. In fact, it's the longest running steam locomotive in America. Now it's gonna take 750 passengers on the ride of their lives. Picking them up in Denver and bringing them here to the magic city of the plains, Cheyenne, Wyoming to see this. The biggest rodeo in the world. It's the most prized ticket in American railroading. All aboard! And I've got a VIP pass. It's a 100 mile straight shot from Cheyenne down to Denver's Union Station. There, we'll turn the train around, collect the rail fans, and bring them back to Cheyenne for the rodeo. Most people think that the age of steam railroading is dead, but not here in Cheyenne. This is home to the largest working steam locomotive shop in America, the UP Steam Shop. Here, a dedicated team of workers are busy getting the 844 ready for her big day. And this gigantic locomotive needs a lot of attention. From one end, the other, it's 114 feet, and it weighs over 450 tons. That's the same weight as a jumbo jet. We're talking a lot of locomotive. Starting this giant locomotive is like waking a sleeping dragon. And that's something you want to do very carefully. If they heat this locomotive up too fast, the metal's going to expand, rivets are going to shoot out, it's going to cause all kinds of damage. So what they do is, they take warm steam, they pump it through this hose into the boiler and warm it up slowly. It's like warming your car on a cold winter's morning, but a lot more dangerous. The temperature of this steam is nearly 400 degrees. That's enough to melt the skin right off your face. So Ed here wants to make sure this hose is on tight. Now we need to fire up the steam generator. Let's go check it out. This over here is the steam generator. Right here. I'm traveling back in time to when cowboys ruled the prairie. Yeehaw! When buffaloes roamed the plains. And when steam trains ran America. Whoa! This is the hardest working steam locomotive in the USA. They don't make them like this anymore, baby. This is living, breathing history right here today. My name is Matt Baum. Ever since I was a kid, I've been obsessed with trains. My day job, I work on a railroad in Maine. But this is my dream to ride the biggest, fastest, most awesome trains in history. This is the Union Pacific 844, the finest steam locomotive ever built. It's been pulling passengers and freight across the country since 1944. In fact, it's the longest running steam locomotive in America. Now it's going to take seven. I'm 
I'm traveling back in time to when cowboys ruled the prairie. Yeehaw! When buffaloes roamed the plains. And when steam trains ran America. Whoa! This is the hardest working steam locomotive in the USA. They don't make them like this anymore, baby. This is living, breathing history right here today. My name is Matt Baum. Ever since I was a kid, I've been obsessed with trains. My day job, I work on a railroad in Maine. But this is my dream. To ride the biggest, fastest, most awesome trains in history. is the Union Pacific 844, the finest steam locomotive ever built. It's been pulling passengers and freight across the country since 1944. In fact, it's the longest running steam locomotive in America. Now it's gonna take 750 passengers on the ride of their lives. Picking them up in Denver and bringing them here to the magic city of the plains, Cheyenne, Wyoming to see this. The biggest rodeo in the world. It's the most prized ticket in American railroading. All aboard! And I've got a VIP pass. It's a 100 mile straight shot from Cheyenne down to Denver's Union Station. There, we'll turn the train around, collect the rail fans, and bring them back to Cheyenne for the rodeo. Most people think that the age of steam railroading is dead. Shut off and all, okay? Bam, it's hooked up, we're ready to start pumping some oil. The oil comes from the truck down there, it's pumped up this hose, goes right into here and down into the tank. You can see it in there, it's filling up. All right, show us the dipstick. Wow, look at that dipstick. Oh, wow. It's getting up there now. About 75 inches is full. It's like a dipstick for your car, except it's about eight feet long. 6,500 gallons of oil might sound like a lot, but this engine sure can drink. For every mile, the 844 burns 15 to 25 gallons of this fuel right here. That's one of the reasons they had to get rid of these locomotives, because they're not very efficient. But filling up with fuel is only half the job. It's not called a steam locomotive for nothing. This locomotive needs water. If you don't have water, you don't have steam. That's the water going into this tank right here, 28,000 gallons, it's gonna make the steam. To stop the engine from getting clogged with lime scale, they add a special chemical to the water. Lime scale is caused by a mineral called calcium carbonate. Above 70 degrees, it forms deposits that can clog the boiler pipes with gunk, and the whole thing could explode. The 844 is loaded with fuel and water. It's time to fire it up. We like fire. This could be dangerous. Ed has on protective gear, could flash back, and it wouldn't be pretty. Okay, we're gonna take this oily rag here. We're gonna set it right on the firebox. We're gonna take this fusee, which is a flare, light it up, light the rag up, throw the rag into the firebox, and blam, fire. What's happening now is the oil is slowly being fed into the firebox and it's very, very hot. It's gonna be a couple of thousand degrees. My gloves feel like they're catching on fire right now. Woo! Looks kind of quiet right now, but soon this is gonna be hauling more than a half mile worth of passenger coaches behind it. It's gonna be going up to 70 miles an hour. It's gonna be freaking awesome, man. This is the magic city of the plains, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Over the next few days, over 300,000 people are gonna be arriving here in Cheyenne. And they're coming to see one thing. The biggest rodeo in the world. And a select few will be coming in on a very special train. This is the Union Pacific number 844. The 844 was the last steam locomotive to be built for the Union Pacific Railroad. 
When it left the factory in 1944, it was the pinnacle of modern engineering. The 844 was built for speed. On the flats, it could pull 26 passenger cars over 100 miles an hour. It could make the trip from Cheyenne to Salt Lake in just 10 hours. Today, it's going from the Union Pacific Yard in Cheyenne, 100 miles south to Denver, to collect 750 rail fans and bring them back to Cheyenne for the rodeo. I've always wanted to ride one of these classic steam locomotives, and now I'm gonna get the chance. But before we can go anywhere, we need to get this 450 ton locomotive on the right track. That's where the turntable comes in. It's like a giant lazy Susan, but for trains. So they can spin the engine around, put it anywhere they want. Here's how it works. A locomotive rolls off one set of tracks onto the turntable. The table spins and lines up with a new set of tracks and the locomotive rolls off again. There's been a turntable here since the 1860s. This one can hold 800 tons on it. It's powered by electricity. Back in the day, they powered it by compressed air. Even before that, they powered it with pure manpower. First, we have to lock the tracks. If the table moves while the locomotive is rolling on, it could derail. Locks it up. Now you can bring a locomotive off the turntable right to this track, right there. That thing is huge. It barely fits on this turntable. Look at it. Once the locomotive is on the turntable, the tracks are unlocked. And with the pull of a lever, I'm spinning a 450-ton piece of railroading history. I'm spinning the 844, what an honor, man! All right, now it's facing towards Denver. Let's go get the coaches. We're gonna hook the 844 onto 26 of America's finest vintage rail cars. The problem is that a lot of them are close to 60 years old. You have to be very delicate. You can't slam them around like freight cars. For the crew, the pressure is on. One mistake in a piece of railroad history could be damaged forever. Here's how they do it. This is Ed. He's the engineer. He controls this beast. All these levers. All these controls, the whistle, it's his job to drive this. He runs the locomotive. The radio communications they have on the 844 isn't something they would have had back in the 1940s. Back then, they would have used hand signals and whistles. One, two, we're standing still. Two tubes, we're going ahead. Three tubes, we're backing up. A succession of short toots like toot, 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 toot. Let's get the heck off the track. Here comes the 844. <laughs> Sucker. Train cars are connected by a device called a coupler. When two couplers hit, they should hook up automatically. All right, we're backing up. We're gonna make the hook. We don't want to make a hard one. We don't want to damage those passenger coaches. They're some of the oldest in America. The hook didn't make. He's going to slam back into the hook. Nice. Well, he was not going to slam. He's going to do it nice and easy. There's the hook. We made it. We're about ready to go. Denver, here we come. The noises are amazing. There's so many different sounds. There's the chuffing, the floor shaking, there's thumping. I'm riding a living, breathing piece of history right here. When the 
844 first rolled out of the factory in the 1940s, it pulled high-speed passenger trains. But when diesel locomotives took over in the 1950s, Union Pacific decided steam engines were too expensive to maintain. In 1959, they stopped commercial steam operations altogether. The 844 was sent to Omaha to work in a yard melting snow off the tracks. By 1960, it was the I'm going to be
only steam engine left in operation and was set aside for special occasions like trips to the rodeo. The 844 is halfway to Denver and we've changed crews. Everyone wants a turn at running a piece of history. I know from running a modern diesel locomotive, it's pretty simple. You just pull the throttle out and go. Up here in the 844, it's a lot different. There's a lot more going on. All right, let's introduce you to the crew. Get Cameron over here, he's the fireman. It's his job to make the steam. You get Steve, that's the engineer. He's running the engine. The more steam the engineer uses, the more the fireman has to keep making it. If the fireman lets the fire go out, the train will literally run out of steam and grind to a halt. Cameron here decides how much oil he wants to feed to the fire. He's looking at what Steve's doing over there with the throttle. Depending on the throttle position, that's going to decide how much steam the, the engine is using. But running out of steam isn't the worst thing that can happen. The most dangerous thing that can happen on a steam locomotive is to run out of water. And the boiler in front of us is about 10 miles of pipes. There's not enough water in this, those pipes. It's going to get really, really hot. Eventually, it's going to explode. The history of steam locomotives is littered with boiler explosions. February 1911, Smithville, Texas. The boiler on a yard engine blows up. Four men lose their lives and 12 are injured. March 1912, San Antonio, Texas. 26 people are killed when a Southern Pacific locomotive explodes. December 1934, Fayette County, West Virginia. A locomotive hauling mine workers blows up, killing 18. It's up to the firemen to keep track of how much water is going into the boiler. Right there's the water glass. That's what the fireman has to watch to make sure there's enough water in the boiler. You see it bobbing down up in there. He's got to keep a keen eye on that. It's a very important part of his job. There's no reserve tank. If the fireman gets the water level wrong, it could be fatal. If there's not enough, the boiler's going to explode. Boom! I'm heading to Denver to pick up a posse of rail fans and take them to the world's biggest rodeo in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Goodbye, Wyoming. Hello, Colorado. It might look pretty, but I've got to tell you, this is one of the scariest trains I've ever ridden because we're doing 60 miles an hour and I can't see where we're going. Modern locomotives have windows at the front, so the engineer and conductor can see what's up ahead. If you want to look at a signal, just look out the window. It's right there in front of you. On this locomotive, the whole locomotive is in front of you, so you've got to stick your head out that window. That's not a problem on a straight track, but on a left-hand curve, the engineer can't see anything. Steve, this is a huge locomotive. So, so how far you, can you see ahead with this big locomotive in front of you? If you're going around a curve, you can't see anything to the left. Steve's going to be blind if we're going around a curve this way. So if there's a red signal or another train, the engineer can't see it coming. But the fireman can. The fireman's also watching the tracks ahead because they're on a curve. That's why they have to have two guys up here. But that's not the scariest thing about this line. Between Denver and Cheyenne, there's only one set of tracks. That means if there's another train coming, it's got to get out of the way, or these guys are going to smash into it. And right now, there is something up ahead. There's a freight train up ahead. One of us better get out of the way, or it's going to get nasty. When a train needs to pass another train on a single track, one of them must go into a special side track called a siding. It's like a passing place on a country road. We're meeting another train. He's coming in the siding here. The freight train is in front of us right now, clearing the main track. He's going into a siding, so he's still out there on the other end, so these guys have to slow down and let him get in the clear. The freight train's out of the way, and the tracks ahead are clear, for a while anyway. Here we go again. The freight trains keep coming. They're not going to stop. 
They run 24-7, even if the old steam train's out here. Today, freight trains along this line carry everything from sneakers to iPods. But 150 years ago, they carried gold. The gold rush of 1858 turned Denver into a mecca for gold prospectors. And the town became a supply hub for the flourishing mining industry. But Denver was isolated. The wagon trains that supplied the city were easy targets for bandits and robbers. But in 1870, the railroad changed everything. This line from Cheyenne brought in essential supplies and shipped out the town's freshly minted gold. As a result, Denver's population grew from 5,000 to over 100,000 in a single generation. in Denver, but we've got a problem. This train is so long, it's like three quarters of a mile long. And look at it, it goes way down there, the engines are way up there. And that is long for a passenger train. In fact, it's too long to fit on the platform. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to make a split. We're gonna put the remaining cars from this track over here to this track right here. Just cut it in two. Here's how you disconnect two cars. All right, there's the, there's the cup holders right there. This is the operating lever. Pull that up, they're gonna be able to disconnect. Right in the middle there, there's the air hoses. That's what connects the brake pipe. Train breaks away, it'll snap itself. Bang. This is the guy pulling the pin right here. There it is. Bang, there's the uncoupling. They're gonna take this part of the train, they're gonna put it on this track right here. And to get it there, we need to throw a switch. This junction here on the tracks, right here, that's a switch. Throwing a switch determines which track the train will go down. It's probably like my 20,000th switch right here. All right, here come our cars. This is the head end of the train. We're putting it on this track right here. All right, we've got the train on two tracks. We've got one half over there, the other half's over here, and voila, the train fits in Denver. Once this locomotive leaves Cheyenne, it's on its own, so it brings this baby with it right here. This is the Art Lockman, it's the maintenance car. It's got every possible thing that locomotive needs on board here. Let's go up inside and take a look. Wow, look at this place. Look at this wrench right here. You think that's big? You think this is a big wrench? I don't think so. I think it's the granddaddy of wrenches right here. Have you ever seen anything like this? This is insane. If something goes wrong with this train, they're not stopping at Walmart. This isn't a monkey wrench. This is a gorilla wrench. <laughs> Man, look at that thing. They've got valve oil. They have engine oil. They've got vice grips. They've got welding rods. They've got a grinder. They've got cable ties. Batteries on charge. Old rubber gloves. Kind of reminds me of my old apartment. We even have a kitchen on this car. We've got a microwave. We've got any snack you can imagine here. Cookies, direct TV. We've got a fridge. This is better than an episode of Cribs. There's a freezer with everything you could imagine in here. We've got this room that has poison gas. Wah, wah. Whenever a train crew are working on the track, they have to make sure that another train doesn't run into them. So before they start work, the crew always sets a blue safety flag to let everyone know that they are there. The blue flag's on. That means people are gonna be working on this train. No other train's gonna be able to come onto this track. The work on these steam locomotives never stop. Every 100 miles or so, you have to lubricate them. These engines are labor intensive, and that's why the railroad got rid of them. I'm gonna give these guys a hand. Here's how this works. They take compressed air from this locomotive, and they power that gun right there. This is grease right here. This might look easy, but inside that gun right there, if my finger goes in there, it's gone. I'm not coming back with it. See 
Yeah. All right, here we go. When it comes out like that, right here, inside that main rod, see it right there? That means that we've got enough grease in there. Every 100 miles, they go through 15 pounds of this grease. All right, it's all greased up. I still have all my fingers. My gloves are nice and dirty. Time to move on. Union Pacific are constantly looking for ways to make today's railroad more high-tech and more efficient. But some of the greatest innovations in railroad technology date back to the 1800s. I'm gonna go check out one of the most amazing feats in American railroading history, and it happened right in those mountains over there. In the 1860s, a gold and silver rush swept the Colorado Rockies. And the fastest growing mining area was 45 miles west of Denver at Georgetown. But getting the ore down the mountain by rail seemed impossible. Until engineers designed the Georgetown Loop. Between Georgetown and the mine at Silver Plume, the track had to climb 850 vertical feet. The only way to do it was with a unique corkscrew design. Best way to see it is in this guy right here. This is a track car. Let's take a ride. This track car is ideal for riding steep mountain railroads. And Steve here is going to show me around. And this, is, this is quite a grade, Steve. What's the, what's the percent up here? This is the steepest part of the grade right here. This is 4%. Wow. So for every 100 feet, you go up four feet or down four feet. That's huge. Most railroads in America never get above a 2% grade. This is some of the steepest track in the country. This is it. This is the Georgetown Loop. This is what it's all about right here. It's like in a parking garage or a spiral staircase. You go around like this to get to the top. This is amazing. Look, you can see the track right down there. It's a little scary right now. I mean, I can feel it in my stomach. Kind of get that roller coaster feeling. At their peak, the mines this railroad service produced over $200 million worth of silver. No matter what way you look at it, it's a lot of money. So this is why these guys were coming up here. And without the Georgetown Loop, they would have never got the silver out. But the railroad didn't stop at the mine. It went inside as well. This is what railroading was all about for silver. They put it in this cart. This is an original cart from the 1880s. They blow this with silver, bring it down to the train, and then they'd haul it to Denver. Let's go inside that mine and take a look. These are the rails that they used to push the ore carts down. These rails have been here since the mine was built in the 1860s. Probably some of the oldest rail in the country right there. Wow, look at that right there. This is called dragon's blood. It's coming out from underneath the rocks here. It's actually silver oxide. This is what the miners were looking for. They knew behind these rocks was silver. Getting the silver out was